Good evening. My name is Dr. Jim Tumlin, and I'm the president of the Faith and Science Lecture Forum. And on behalf of the Faith and Science Lecture Forum, we'd like to welcome you to tonight's debate. For many of us, the first time that we understood the awesome expanse of the universe, the indescribable power of the sun, or the breathtaking complexity and beauty of a single cell, we were driven by a deep desire to know and to be known by the creator of all of this splendor. As the Apostle Paul put it, for since the foundation and the creation of the world, his invisible attributes have been known by that which is made, even his Godhead and his eternal power. For many others, however, the universe and all that it contains, while amazing, is the product of mere chance, a random collection of molecules uh, that uh, ultimately uh, does not point toward the hand of a creator, but in fact has no meaning at all. As the famous Harvard paleontologist uh, George Simpson put it, man is the product of a random and purposeless process that never had him in mind. As our knowledge of science has increased over the years, many of us have asked the question, did God create us in all that is seen in him and through him? Or have we, by an innate fear or a need for significance and purpose, created God? Tonight, we're going to address that question, a question that for most of us is most likely the most important question you will ever ask. Does God exist? And to do that in a thoughtful and rigorous manner, the Faith and Science Lecture Forum has invited Mr. William F. Buckley to moderate uh, tonight's debate. Mr. Buckley was born in 1925 in New York City. He is a widely acknowledged author and lecturer. He is the recipient of over 38 honorary degrees from universities across the country including uh, the Presidential Medal of Honor in 1991. His recent book, Near My God, is a brilliant treatise of his own journey toward faith and ultimately underscores his ability to moderate religious lectures. And if, would you please welcome with me Mr. William F. Buckley. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm happy to be a, a witness to the forthcoming exchange. I'm not um, renowned as a moderator, and wonder at the confidence of Dr. Tumlin in uh, nominating me to uh, moderate this titanic struggle. <laughs> I will, of course, attempt to be scrupulously fair. I do this for professional reasons, but there is the further reason that uh, to attempt to uh, block either of the protagonists in pursuit of their arguments would, be, would betray my uh, utter innocence of scientific uh, abstractions, the mention of which prompts me to urge the eminent scientists, philosophers here, to talk to us, please, uh, and to remember the gentle benefits of the idiomatic mode. We are gathered together tonight in an effort to communicate with one another, and to do this requires uh, that we have a continuing idea of what it is that we're talking about. Uh, as you are aware, the argument uh, is over whether the evidence for and against uh, the existence of, of God uh, ultimately prevails, whether the preponderance of, of, of evidence uh, argues the existence of God. Professor William Lane Craig uh, believing, as he does, that it does prevail. Dr. Craig returned from a ministry in Belgium, uh, resides in Atlanta, and continues to work in his uh, various campuses. He received his doctorate in philosophy from the University of uh, Birmingham, and a second doctorate in theology from the University of uh, uh, Munich. He has published an astonishing 89 papers in peer-reviewed journals. His latest book is called Reasonable Faith, Christian Truth and, Apologex on, and Apologetics. On the side of the devil is Peter Atkins. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Atkins' uh, doctorate is in physical chemistry <coughs> from Lincoln College at Oxford. He also is a prodigious uh, writer, having published uh, 
36 uh, peer-reviewed uh, articles, many of them designed to undermine a belief in a divine creator. He is an eloquent and uh, learned uh, advocate. Uh, Dr. Atkins has also done considerable work on his ministry over radio and television. Uh, the format calls for initial statements by the two contenders of 18 minutes uh, each. They will be uh, uh, they will be followed by nine-minute rebuttals. Now, I'm not going to pull a lever and cause the speakers to disappear into the bowels of the earth if they go five seconds over <laughs> their allotted period. But if they do go a half minute over, I will make my impatient presence, our presence, uh, felt. So I do urge them to keep their eyes on the clock and urge you to pay close attention to them. Please proceed. Good evening. I want to begin by thanking the Faith and Science Lecture Forum for inviting me to participate in tonight's debate, and I'm delighted that you have come out on a stormy evening to think about this most important of questions with us tonight. Now, in tonight's debate, we've been asked to address two basic questions. One, what is the evidence for the existence of God? And two, what is the evidence against the existence of God? Now, with respect to that second question, I'll leave it up to Dr. Atkins to present the evidence against God's existence. But notice that atheists have tried for centuries to disprove the existence of God, but no one's ever been able to come up with a successful argument. So, rather than attack straw men, I'll just wait to hear Dr. Atkins' answer to the following question. What good evidence is there to think that God does not exist. So let's turn to that first question. What good evidence is there to think that God does exist? I believe that there are many reasons for the existence of God, but due to limits of time, I'm going to restrict myself to sketching briefly five reasons why I think God exists. Now in all of our reasoning, we have to be careful to follow the basic rules of logic which have governed all valid reasoning since Aristotle. Number one, then, the origin of the universe. Have you ever asked yourself where the universe came from? Why everything exists instead of just nothing? Typically, atheists have said that the universe is just eternal and uncaused. But the astrophysical evidence indicates that the universe began to exist in a great explosion called the Big Bang 15 billion years ago. Most laymen do not appreciate that not only were all matter and energy created in that event, but physical space and time themselves. This is of utmost importance, for it implies, as the Cambridge astronomer Fred Hoyle points out, that the Big Bang Theory requires the creation of the universe from nothing. Now, this tends to be very awkward for the atheist. For as Anthony Kenny of Oxford University urges, a proponent of the Big Bang Theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the universe came from nothing and by nothing. But surely that doesn't make sense. Out of nothing, nothing comes. So where did the universe come from? Why does the universe exist instead of just nothing? There must have been a cause which brought the universe into being. We can summarize our argument thus far as follows. Premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. Now from the very nature of the case as the cause of space and time, this cause must be an uncaused, changeless, timeless, 
and immaterial being of unimaginable power which created the universe. It must be timeless and therefore changeless because it created time, because it also created space. It must transcend space as well and therefore be immaterial, not physical. Moreover, I would argue, it must also be personal. For a changeless, impersonal cause can never exist without its effect. If the changeless, impersonal conditions for an effect are timelessly present, then their effect must be timelessly present as well. For example, the cause of water's freezing is the temperature being below zero degrees centigrade. If the temperature were below zero from eternity, then any water around would be frozen from eternity. It would be impossible for the water to just begin to freeze a finite time ago. The only way for the cause to be timeless and for the effect to begin a finite time ago is for the cause to be a personal agent who freely chooses to create a new effect without any prior determining conditions. For example, a man sitting from eternity could freely will to stand up, and thus you would have a new effect arise from an eternal cause. And thus we are brought not merely to a transcendent cause of the universe, but to its personal creator. In his book, The Creation, Dr. Atkins struggles mightily to explain how the universe could come into existence uncaused out of nothing. But in the end, he finds himself trapped in self-contradiction. He states, now we go back in time beyond the moment of creation to when there was no time and to where there was no space. At this time before time, he imagines a swirling dust of mathematical points which recombine again and again and again and finally come by trial and error to form our space-time universe. Now, it needs to be honestly said that this is not a scientific hypothesis. It is pop metaphysics and of the worst kind, for it's obviously self-contradictory since it assumes time and space in order to explain the origin of time and space. As a scientist David Park writes, it is deceptively easy to imagine events before the Big Bang, but in physics there is no way to make sense of these imaginings. As if this were not bad enough, Dr. Atkins compounds the problem by asking where the mathematical points came from. His answer? Time brought the points into being, and the points brought time into being. This is like saying the chicken brought the egg into being, and the egg brought the chicken into being. It's no wonder that in his review of Dr. Atkins' book in the Times Literary Supplement, the philosopher John Leslie asks incredulously, how could such nonsense have been churned out by the author of a superb textbook like Physical Chemistry? In fact, Dr. Atkins' Oxford University colleague, Keith Ward, in his book, God, Chance, and Necessity, points out no less than seven such logical fallacies in Dr. Atkins' scenario. Ward concludes that it is, quote, blatantly self-contradictory and so cannot be true. By contrast, the view that Christian theists have always held that there is a personal creator of the universe is not only logically consistent, but it also follows logically from the premises that I have laid out. Number two, the complex order in the universe. During the last 30 years or so, scientists have discovered that the existence of intelligent life depends upon a delicate and complex balance of initial conditions simply given in the Big Bang itself. We now know that life-prohibiting universes are vastly more probable than any life-permitting universe like ours. How much more probable? 
The answer is that the chances that the universe should be life permitting are so infinitesimal as to be incalculable and incomprehensible. For example, Stephen Hawking has estimated that if the rate of the universe's expansion had been smaller by even one part in a hundred thousand million million, the universe would have recollapsed into a hot fireball. Brandon Carter has calculated that the odds against the initial conditions being suitable for later star formation, without which planets could not exist, is one followed by a thousand billion billion zeros, at least. PCW Davies estimates that a change in the strength of gravity or of the weak force by only one part in 10 to the 100th power would have prevented a life-permitting universe. There are around 50 such quantities and constants present in the Big Bang which must be fine-tuned in this way if the universe is to permit life. So improbability is multiplied by improbability by improbability until our minds are reeling in incomprehensible numbers. There is no physical reason why these constants and quantities possess the values they do. The former agnostic physicist Paul Davies comments, through my scientific work, I have come to believe more and more strongly that the physical universe is put together with an ingenuity so astonishing that I cannot accept it merely as a brute fact. Similarly, Fred Hoyle remarks, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics. And Robert Jastrow, the head of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, has called this the most powerful evidence for the existence of God ever to come out of science. We can summarize our reasoning as follows. Premise one, the fine tuning of the initial conditions of the universe is due to either natural law, chance, or design. Two, it is not due to either law or chance. Three, therefore, it is due to design. Number three, objective moral values in the world. If God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. Many theists and atheists alike agree on this point. Michael Roos, a noted agnostic philosopher of science, explains, the position of the modern evolutionist is that morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction and any deeper meaning is illusory. Friedrich Nietzsche, the great atheist of the last century who proclaimed the death of God, understood that the death of God meant the destruction of all meaning and value in life. I think that Friedrich Nietzsche was right. But we've got to be very careful here. The question here is not, must we believe in God in order to live moral lives. I'm not claiming that we must. Nor is the question, can we recognize objective moral values without believing in God? I think that we certainly can. Rather, the question is, if God does not exist, do objective moral values exist? Like Nietzsche and Roos, I just don't see any reason to think that in the absence of God, the morality evolved by Homo sapiens is objective. And here, Dr. Atkins would agree with me. He says, I see no evidence for its absoluteness, and the ethics of a lion seem to be quite different than the ethics of an antelope. As for human beings, he says, we are just slime on a planet belonging to one sun. On the atheistic view, then, some action, say, rape, may not be socially advantageous, and so in the course of human development has become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to prove that rape is really wrong. On the atheistic view, there's nothing really wrong with your raping someone. Thus, without God, there is no absolute right and wrong. 
But the problem is that objective values do exist, and deep down, we all know it. There's no more reason to deny the objective reality of moral values than the objective reality of the physical world. Actions like rape, cruelty, and child abuse aren't just socially unacceptable behavior. They're moral abominations. Some things, at least, are really wrong. Similarly, love, equality, and self-sacrifice are really good. Thus, we can summarize this third consideration as follows. Premise one, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Two, objective values do exist. Three, therefore, God exists. Number four, the historical facts concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, was a remarkable individual. New Testament critics have reached something of a consensus that the historical Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, the authority to stand and speak in God's place. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come, and as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracles and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then it would seem that we have a divine miracle on our hands and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now, Dr. Atkins says, I know of no evidence that the resurrection did take place. But there are actually three established facts recognized by the majority of New Testament historians today which I believe are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus. Fact number one, on the Sunday following his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was discovered empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian scholar who has specialized in the study of the resurrection, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the prominent New Testament critic of Vanderbilt University, Gaut Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. These appearances were witnessed not only by believers, but also by unbelievers, skeptics, and even enemies. Fact number three, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus despite having every predisposition to the contrary. Luke Johnson, a New Testament scholar at Emory University says, some sort of powerful transformative experience is required to generate the sort of movement earliest Christianity was. N.T. Wright, an eminent British scholar, concludes, that is why, as an historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. There is no plausible naturalistic explanation of these three facts. Therefore, it seems to me, the Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. But that entails that God exists. Finally, number five, the immediate experience of God. This isn't really an argument for God's existence. Rather, it's the claim that you can know that God exists wholly apart from arguments simply by immediately experiencing him. This was the way people in the Bible knew God. As Professor John Hick explains, to them, God was not an idea adopted by the mind, but an experiential reality which gave significance to their lives. Now, if this is so, then there's a danger that proofs for God could actually distract your attention from God himself. If you're sincerely seeking God, then God will make his existence evident to you. The Bible promises, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We mustn't so concentrate on the external proofs that we fail to hear the inner voice of God speaking to our own hearts. 
for those who listen, God becomes an immediate reality in their lives. In conclusion, then, we've yet to see any evidence to show that God does not exist, and we have seen five reasons to think that God does exist. Together, these reasons constitute a powerful cumulative case for the existence of God. If Dr. Atkins wants us to believe atheism instead, then he must first tear down all five of the reasons that I presented, and then in their place erect a case of his own to prove that God does not exist. And less, and until he does that, I think we can conclude that theism is the more plausible worldview. Dr. Atkins. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here, and it's a, always a great pleasure to come to this country. I come from a college in the University of Oxford that was founded 570 years ago when the Lollard heresy was proving a threat to both church and state. And the ch college was founded, and I quote from the founder's statute, to overcome those who with their swinish snouts imperil the pearls of true theology. Now, I regret to say that my own swinish snout has not been overcome, and I intend to imperil what purport to be the the pearls that will be cast about this evening. But I don't intend to be negative in all my remarks. I respect the reason for all your being here and that it's really a part of the, tr the, the search for truth. I intend to open your eyes to the delights of true understanding. In fact, it's my intention this evening to take your minds on a journey and lead you from the darkness of ignorance to the light of comprehension. I'm here to do no less than to glorify the human spirit and to enhance your joy at being a part of this astonishing, amazing, enthralling, and delightful world. Now, this journey will be strenuous and take your minds to the highest altitudes of um, current thought. Therefore, I have to ask you that you divest yourself of unnecessary baggage. Your souls will have to fly with me to the, uh, the heights of human understanding. They must not be weighed down with the ballast of preconception, prejudice, and that heaviest anchor of all, the conditioning that societies impose on their young. So I ask you to shed the shackles of prejudice and conditioning and listen as though intellectually naked to my words. I hope that you will gradually dress your minds in my ideas as I unfold them, and so bring enlightenment to your brains and a bit of joy to your lives. Now, our joint journey begins with a premise of great antiquity and indeed beautiful simplicity. But if a simple explanation of an event or a phenomenon is fully adequate, then a more elaborate one is not warranted. The challenge in this debate, therefore, is for me to show that everything in and of the world of the body and of the spirit can be understood without needing to invoke the action or mere presence of a god. Now, I have to stress that whereas the assertion of god as an explanation of anything has an air of sublime simplicity, that simplicity is an illusion. An omniscient and omnipotent being that can create a universe, some say maintain that universe, that can intrude into the universe to achieve miracles and resurrections, is no simple entity. A god is the apotheosis of complexity, not the apotheosis of simplicity. And the invocation of a god as an explanation of anything even the warm sentimental feelings that are said to suffuse us in the presence of the Almighty is in fact the apotheosis of laziness. It's well suited to armchair brains who prefer to indulge in adipose arguments. You're not here, I trust, because you're one of those. Now the invocation of God as an explanation of anything is an admission of defeat and of ignorance, 
disguised as a pretense of understanding. I've set myself a challenge to show that everything in and of the world of the body and of the spirit can be understood without needing to invoke a god. There's no point in being an atheist, and certainly a scientist, without being rigorously intellectually honest. So I have to set myself an honest target, which is nothing less than complete explanation. Nothing fudged, nothing forgotten. The atheist argument fails if in the end it turns out that the universe had to be designed. It fails if any aspect of it had to be made. It fails if it turns out that there had to be a seed the size of a pea or even the size of a proton. We atheists must not cloud the issue. That's for the religious who do it so admirably and on such a cosmic scale. The atheist argument fails if it turns out that there is a purpose for the world. The atheist argument fails if it turns out that there is an afterlife that miracles occur, or that a god is necessary to maintain the workings of physical law. The atheist argument begins to corrode if there are aspects of the human condition that science cannot touch, such as the supreme joy of artistic creation. That, then, is the challenge. Nothing less than complete explanation. Therefore, inevitably, I have to disappoint you. Science cannot yet explain everything. It cannot yet tell us what went on at the event we call the creation. It cannot yet provide a theory or even a simulation of consciousness. It would be quite wrong of me to pretend that it could. However, what I can hope to do is to present you with a scientific view of the world, a view that makes a convincing case that science can elucidate the great questions that have for centuries been regarded as religion's own. And with your newly cleansed, deprejudiced minds, you should be able to accept that science provides a richer, more comprehensible, more reliable, more deeply satisfying account of the cosmos than the primitive pseudo-explanations peddled by well-meaning but scientifically under-informed apologists. I deal with the most difficult problem first, creation ex nihilo. The adipose argument is that God did it. That, of course, is the lazy man's elixir, sort of a cocktail made up of a swig of credulity and a teaspoonful of unwillingness to think. In short, it's an explanation that avoids explanation. Science has moved cautiously but steadily towards the provision of a true understanding. I will not bore you with accounts of the events after the Big Bang, which is now universally believed by scientists to be a broadly correct description of the events immediately following the creation. I want to explore whether it is conceivable that science can elucidate the events at the creation. For that is where the atheist stands on the most dangerous ground. Notice that I intend to confront issues, not evade them. Science proceeds by exposing the true simplicity that underlies perceived complexity. Scientists are hewers of simplicity from complexity. I believe that it is possible for science to formulate an account and it will be a mathematical account, full of precision, full of logical authority, full of the testability that is such a kingly quality of science, of what went on at the Big Bang, when space-time itself and the laws of nature came into existence. Science can already show that a creator had less to do than perhaps meets the eye. Let me present one tiny technical argument this evening. How much electric charge is there in the universe? The answer is none. We know experimentally that there is an equal amount of positive and negative charge, which if summed together gives zero charge 
over all. At the creation, no charge separated into opposite charges. Nothing separated into opposites. Secondly, and more pertinently, how much material is there in the universe? Another way to answer this question is to ask how much energy there is in the universe. For Einstein showed that mass and energy are equivalent. When the sum is done, and that involves adding together all the masses of all the protons, all the people, all the priests, all the planets, all the stars and all the galaxies, as well as the gravitational attraction between them, the answer is close to zero. I suspect that as observations are refined, the total will approach zero. There is no energy in the universe. Nothing did indeed come from nothing. Science shows that the universe is in fact a big confidence trick. There is truly nothing here. All there is is a separation of opposites. Now what that argument shows is that the event that took place at the creation is very much simpler than one might think. God, if he had to do anything, did not have to make anything. All he had to do, if he had anything to do at all, was to separate nothing into equal and opposite components. Now that doesn't solve the problem of what went on at the creation, but it makes creation ex nihilo a far simpler process than you might have thought, for literally nothing had to be made. That argument at least diminishes God's role. Now, I could also sketch in an argument that suggests how the reorganization of nothing could take place a causally. There is, of course, no causality before the arena of space-time has been established, so it would be absurd to project backwards our familiarity with causality in our current arena and use it as an argument for God in an arena when space-time did not exist. No one knows how space-time came into being a causally, but there are hints. I would like to say what I think happened, but happily Dr. Craig has done that for me. But quite honestly, I don't think it matters what I think went, what, when, what I think what went on at the creation, because it would be just pure speculation. Speculation without the rigor of mathematics and observation is as syrupy a bog as religion. All I want to leave you with is the realization that the universe is an engagingly reorganized form of nothing and that speculative a-causal events are capable of seeing it come into being without intervention. No God was needed to make the universe or even to make it happen. My argument diminishes the role of a creator God to zero. Another potent argument produced by adipose brains in favor of a mental labor-saving God is the apparent fine-tuning of the structure of the universe as it tumbled into existence. People intent upon proving the hand of a designer um, bandy about amazing figures. Ten to the this, ten to the that. We've had tens followed by imaginable number of zeros already this evening. All such calculations are sort of hocus-pocus and bunkum. There is no a priori, priori way of calculating the probability of the existence of the universe. However, I do have to admit that it gives the impression of being well designed. Had I a lazy brain, I would lie back and leave it at that and accept that design implied designer and hence a god in one of his disguises. But not having a lazy brain, I look for a simpler explanation. Several spring to mind. One possibility is that by chance the universe tumbled into being with this particular mix of fundamental constants. There's no way of calculating the probability of that, but it would, I concede, be exceedingly remote. Nevertheless, if something can happen, it could happen. Someone wins the lottery. The second possibility is that a universe can come into existence only with a particular mix of fundamental constants, 
other universes, some with pi equals 42, others with bright pink electrons weighing a ton, might bubble into incipient existence but collapse again through want of stability or in some way being logically self-inconsistent. A third possibility is that there are trillions and trillions of universes with trillions more popping up into existence as I speak. Now, I must emphasize that I most definitely do not have in mind the profligate many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which I find personally distasteful. I mean real, actual universes defining their own space-time and with a unique mix of fundamental constants. Some have pi equals 3.15, others have pi equals 3.16, ours happen to have pi equals 3.14, and bingo, it permits the emergence of life. Now, there would be some who say that a trillion universes is more demanding than a single universe with its one creator. That's logical nonsense. An unstructured, unmade, totally chaotic emergence of random universes without a god is a far, far less complex happening than a single, awesomely well-defined universe with an omnipotent creator. One is random, the other structured. Unless you can show explicitly that this random chance event cannot account for all there is, you have no right to resort to the extraordinarily complex proposition that there is a God who did it. Let me turn briefly to the purpose of the universe, which some aver exists and which they assert gives credence to an al almighty God. It's so important to distinguish real questions that, when answered, illuminate the deep structure of the world from invented questions that elucidate only the psychology of the individual or the society that poses them. Many religious questions are of the second kind. Now, windows onto the psyche of the soul, not windows onto the heart of matter. Purpose is an excellent example of the latter, ranking alongside the prospect of an afterlife, the nature of the soul, the significance of the resurrection, and so on. Bertrand Russell put it well when he considered the prospect of there being a teapot in orbit around Mars. If enough people start convincing themselves that there is a teapot in orbit around Mars, then it soon becomes an object of scholarly debate and extraordinarily difficult to disprove by logic, or more reliably, by experiment. Cosmic purpose is a cosmic teapot. There is not one jot of evidence for cosmic purpose. It's a reverse engineering of the quest for God. There is a God, the argument runs, therefore there must be a purpose in his creation of the world. How much simpler it is to accept, in line with all the evidence, that there is no cosmic purpose, that it has been invented by humans to match their vision of God, and now turned round to justify the existence of God. God is not necessary for the inception of or actions of the world. There is no purpose. Is there any cranny where a nearly defunct God can lurk? I hear you say, morality. Now the concept of goodness has emerged as we have evolved. Goodness is not God-given. There is an innate genetic foundation of goodness modulated by the intellect that we've developed. We have emerged from a past where the pressures of the hostile environment led to the operation of group activities that established unconsciously a social contract that secured us from our enemies. We fragile beings, on the whole, discovered that killing one another led to the collapse of the tribe. With the evolution of our massive brains, we could stand above the prospect of private and public carnage and at least discuss it rationally, even though we continue to make misjudgments about its efficacy. 
There is no need to see the hand of God in this evolving pattern of behavior. Unless you can show explicitly that evolution, allied with intellect, is an inadequate foundation for morality, you have no right to import the concept of God in the third of his disguises. I've spoken long enough this evening. But let me summarize my position. I cannot prove that there is not a God. The perception of God overwhelms any rational argument, for an omnipotent entity is the ultimate chameleon. However, I have tried to argue that the common purportedly rational reasons for believing in God are vacuous, for all the actions that God has been thought necessary for can be achieved without, in, without any intrusion into natural order. I ask you to discard your prejudices. Civilization and science have led you on a journey from bewilderment to maturity. It's time to respect the nobility of the human spirit, the awesome power of human comprehension, as expressed in that apotheosis of the Renaissance science. It's time to stand full square in front of this awesomely wonderful world and to accept that we are gloriously, gloriously alone. Thank you. Dr. Craig, you have nine minutes for your rebuttal. You remember I said in my first speech that Dr. Atkins needed to give us some evidence against the existence of God. And I noticed a discernible lack of such evidence in that opening speech. He gave us refutations of my arguments, but he provided no argumentation whatsoever that God does not exist. And he's got to do that if he's going to convince us of atheism. Kai Nielsen, who is an atheist philosopher, recognizes this point. Nielsen says, to show that an argument is invalid or unsound is not to show that the conclusion of the argument is false. All the proofs of God's existence may fail, but it may still be the case that God exists. In short, to show that the proofs do not work is not enough by itself. It may still be the case that God exists. So at best, Dr. Atkins has simply left us with agnosticism tonight. He hasn't given us any good reason in that opening speech to think that God does not exist. Now, he did make a couple of general comments about the nature of explanation. He said that we should prefer simpler explanations to more elaborate ones, and I would agree, all things being equal, that's true. And I would say that theism is a simple explanation in that it provides a unifying view of the world that explains a vast range of data, scientific, historical, ethical, and personal. He says, but it's just intellectual laziness to conclude to the existence of God, to say that God is the reason or the explanation for something. But notice that many of the arguments that I gave tonight were deductive arguments. That is to say, if the premises are true, then the conclusion logically follows. Whether you like it or not, whether you regard it as explanatory or not, is irrelevant. In a deductive argument, as long as the premises are true and the logic is valid, the conclusion is inescapable. And therefore, he's simply got to dispute my premises. It's not enough to simply say that God is not a good explanation. So let's look then specifically at the case that I laid out for the existence of God. First, my argument from the origin of the universe. Notice that he actually agrees with my two premises, that whatever begins to exist has a cause, and secondly, that the universe began to exist. Why then does he conclude that the universe does not have a cause? Well, did you catch how radical his view is? Because he doesn't really believe the universe exists. On Dr. Atkins' view, nothing exists. So it's not that something came out of nothing. He literally believes nothing exists. As he writes in his article, we, like mathematics, are elegant, self-consistent reorganizations of nothing. Now, let me make three responses to this. First of all, it's a total misunderstanding to say that because the negative energy balances out the positive energy, that therefore there is nothing. That's as illogical as saying that because I have a certain amount of debts and I have a certain amount of money, that therefore I have zero money. It's just illogical. Even if on balance it balances out to nothing, 
there's still negative energy and positive energy. It doesn't mean that nothing exists. Secondly, I would point out that you still need a productive cause for the universe, even if it's the case that you don't need a material cause for the universe. Christopher Isham, who is the leading quantum cosmologist of Great Britain, points out in his article, Cosmos and Creation, there is still a need for ontic seeding to produce the energy, even if on balance it is not. So you still need to have an ontic seed, a, a beginning, a cause, to bring the positive and negative energy into being, even if on balance it's not. But finally, as I say, his solution, I think, is simply absurd. His solution is that nothing exists. And that's simply uh, absurd. I at least exist. As Descartes said, even when I doubt that I exist, who is there to do the doubting? I doubt, therefore I am. There must be <laughs> something that exists. So I hope you under understand how radical this alternative is. If honestly, the, uh, the alternative to belief in the existence of God is to say that nothing is real, nothing exists, then I say let those who decry the irrationality of belief in God be henceforth forever silent, because nothing could be more irrational or implausible than that. Now what about my second argument from the complex order in the universe? Here he raised three questions. First he says, there are problems of probability here. In a lottery, any person's winning is improbable, but somebody has to win. The analogy is a bad one. It's not the improbability of just any universe existing. That's right, any universe is equally improbable. It is the specified improbability of a life-permitting universe existing. The analogy would be a lottery in which there's a billion, billion, billion black balls and one white ball, and you have to reach in and pick out a ball. Now, any single ball you pick is equally improbable, but it is overwhelmingly more probable that whichever ball you pick, it will be black rather than white. In the same way, given the fine-tuning of the initial conditions of the universe, it is vastly more probable that the universe should be life-prohibiting. What is his explanation for the life-permitting universe that exists? Well, he gives two speculations. First, he says, maybe there is only one physically possible universe. It has to be this way. I think that sort of a theory of everything is uh, simply not a credible alternative. PCW Davies says, and I quote, there is absolutely no evidence in favor of it. Even if the laws of physics were unique, it doesn't follow that the physical universe itself is unique. The laws must be augmented by cosmic initial conditions. It seems then that the physical universe does not have to be the way it is. It could have been otherwise. So we have to have an explanation for why we are balanced on this knife's edge that permits our own existence. Secondly, though, he says you could have many parallel universes. Let me just make three points about this. First, this is a metaphysical hypothesis, not a scientific one. And as such, it's no better than a divine designer. In fact, Occam's razor would say that a divine designer is simpler because instead of positing an infinite number of randomly ordered parallel worlds, you posit one single designer, and that is a simpler hypothesis and therefore to be preferred. Secondly, there is no known way for such a collection of parallel universes to be formed. We've already seen that Dr. Atkins' scenario of universes tumbling into being from prior mathematical points is self-contradictory. Third, the mechanisms that have been suggested for forming parallel universes still require fine-tuning in order to get the mechanism generated for making these parallel worlds so that fine-tuning isn't escaped. Finally, there is no independent evidence for parallel universes but there is for God, such as the moral argument. So let's turn to that moral argument then. Notice that he admits that without God there are no objective moral values. He writes in one of his works, science shows us that there can be no moral distinction between an administered poison and one that the body itself is slowly generated. Do you understand what he's saying? There's no moral distinction between poisoning someone deliberately and that person dying of natural causes. Now, I hope that Dr. Atkins and his wife are happily married, because if she believes that, uh, then if I were he, I'd start eating in restaurants. Uh, I think that on a serious note, it's evident that there is a moral distinction between deliberate murder and just dying a natural death. As John Healy, the executive director of uh, Amnesty International, wrote, recently wrote in a fundraising letter, 
He said, I am writing you today because I think you share my profound belief that there are indeed some moral absolutes. When it comes to torture, to government-sanctioned murder, to disappearances, there are no lesser evils. These are outrages against all of us. So if you agree with me that there are objective moral values, then I think you should also agree that God exists as their foundation. Dr. Atzins did not address the historical evidence from the empty tomb, the appearances of Jesus, and the origin of the disciples' faith for the resurrection of Christ, which provides miraculous evidence of God's existence, nor did he address the immediate experience of God. It seems to me that in the absence of any positive arguments for atheism tonight, I'm rational in believing in God on the basis of my own immediate experience of God. Why should I deny that real experience in my life for no good reason at all? So in the absence of positive arguments for atheism, I think I'm perfectly rational and within my rights to stick with my belief in the existence of God. Dr. Atkins. It seems to me that the challenges for those who propose the more complicated explanation have to present their arguments unless they accept the simpler one. I can propose, I can propose that science can account for everything there is in the world without the invocation of the complexity of a creator and a god. What the, a believer has to do is to demonstrate explicitly that my view about the simplicity, the innate, inherent simplicity of the world is inadequate. It's only by showing that it is an inadequate understanding of the world that I am prepared to accept that there may be room for a god. No arguments that we've heard this evening go that far. None of them say that this explicitly shows that the universe cannot come in by chance alone. No argument we've heard this evening explicitly excludes the possibility that the values of the fundamental constants are the ones that are necessary for life. That is what the opposition have to do. They have to show that simplicity is inadequate. Atheism is the more primitive, of course you would agree with that, atheism is, is, the, is the more primitive view of the world which has to be displaced. It's only through historical accident that the belief in gods, which was engendered by the bewilderment of our ancestors as they dropped down from the trees and were surrounded by forces that they needed to conjole. It's only that historical accident that has brought religion into its powerful prime position with the believers pretending that it is our duty to displace it. That is not the case. We, from the viewpoint of modern 20th century science, can see our way to accounting for everything that religion purports to explain, but in fact fails to explain, even though it's been trying to explain it for 5,000 years. I'm invited, Dr. Craig says that his arguments will fail if his deductive mode can be uh, uh, argued against. Are his premises false? The origin of the universe. I sh argued that n there was nothing to be made. I did not argue that there was nothing here now. I think it quite right that, there, that, that we should regard the current universe as an elaborate and engaging rearrangement of nothing. There was nothing for God to do. That's a simplification. Science, of course, cannot account for Science cannot account for it in detail, but at least give it a chance to try. And what science will do is what religion cannot do, that is, it will provide an explanation this side of the grave. If you want to believe in God and the arguments that Dr. Craig has presented this evening, you can only be confident about them after you are dead. That seems to me to be a grave um, intrusion into, into, into human logic. Complex order, I have argued there. I was 
my argument was greatly maligned in, uh, in, in Dr. Craig's response. I will not go into that. I don't have further time this evening. Let me talk about the things that I didn't have time to think about in my original talk. The historicity of Jesus. I mean, I know I'm on dangerous ground here because it's not my subject. But I don't believe that the Gospels, written as they were decades after the event, are a true record of what actually happened. Anyone who bases their belief on the Gospels is in fact showing that they are credible to a stage beyond belief. Okay, I'll accept that Jesus did exist, but I will not accept that there were any miracles. David Hume said that there is always more reason to, to, um, to disbelieve the messenger than to believe the, messi the message. And with, with, with miracles, that is exactly the case. People wanted to make a case. People wanted to make a case that they had a savior. People wanted to make a case that here was the Messiah. There were committees, 80 years after the events, setting, sitting down, thinking about what should have gone on, and then writing it down as though it did go on. As for immediate experience of God, I'm afraid that is just self-delusion. We all want to be immortal, at least I want to be immortal. I know the only way of being immortal is to encourage investment in science and medicine. I don't believe that one can be immortal through belief in, in the Bible. It's people who simply wish to believe, who feel alone in this world, who want comfort, who are lost, who don't know their position in the world, who want to avoid the sense, the prospect of their own annihilation, who believe in things that Dr. Craig was terming the immediate experience of God. Self-delusion, nothing other than self-delusion. So, in summary, I would say give science a chance. Give science this simple understanding of the world, this simple explanation of all there is, can come from science. If science fails to deliver, if science fails to deliver this side of the grave, then, by all means, turn to religion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Atkins. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, management uh, stipulates that here there will be a 10-minute uh, intermission, after which um, uh, Dr. Atkins and Dr. Craig and I will discuss points that have been raised. Uh, during those 10 minutes, I'm going to sit here and look at my notes, so please ignore me. See you in a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>